Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Eddie Green, Associate Professor of Medicine uh, at Mayo Clinic. Uh, today, my colleagues and I um, from cardiology um, um, will be convening a roundtable review on the recently uh, completed CARES uh, trial. I'm joined by Dr. Margaret Redfield and uh, Dr. Hong uh, Chen. Dr. Redfield is Director of our Circulatory Failure Program uh, and Dr. Chen is Professor of Medicine. Welcome, Maggie and Horn. Thanks, Andrew. Glad to have you with us today. Thanks, good to be here. Um, we are interested in hearing about the recent results of the trial to look at the response to volume removal in cardiorenal syndrome or in acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, as you well know, cardiologists and nephrologists deal with this problem of issues surrounding how much volume to remove in this setting whether or not it affects renal function, and how much it might actually help cardiac function uh, as well. And we're looking forward to hearing about your insights from this recently completed uh, trial. Can you uh, start by giving us a brief overview of what the trial was about and what the results sort of implicated for us? Great, maybe I'll start. And, okay, um, thank you. This trial was uh, completed uh, by the Heart Failure Clinical Research Network, which in an NIH-sponsored consortium okay. of leading heart failure sites across the United States, nine sites sure. uh, and associated institutions, uh, who designed and conducted this trial. Um, so very rigorous NIH-funded uh, trial. And the hypothesis was that in patients who have acutely decompensated heart failure, who are still very congested despite outpatient or sure. inpatient diuretic therapy and who are developing worsening renal function as evidenced by an increase in the creatinine of 0.3, that switching then to ultrafiltration based volume removal strategy versus a stepped pharmacologic care uh, strategy using diuretics mm -hmm. and escalating doses and if needed um, renal vasodilators or systemic vasoactive uh, uh, compounds that there would be a difference in that strategy that ultrafiltration would remove more fluid sure. and be gentler on the kidney so that was the hypothesis correct okay and were the outcomes um, um, clear from the study suggesting that this did happen in those patients, or did the trial turn out um, differently? Can you comment on that? Please? Yeah, maybe I will take a shot at that. So you know, we um, we had a what I what I would consider a, a unique endpoint. It's a it's a bivariate analysis of weight loss and change in creatinine, and I think that is important because uh, we've learned recently that not only is renal function important, but decongesting patient is equally important actually. Hence, uh, we have this unique bivariate endpoint of weight loss, uh, which is surrogate for decongestion sure. versus creatinine. Okay. And indeed, um, our hypothesis was, uh, was proven to be wrong. That uh, in a, we saw in the, in the step care, pharmacological care group, um, there was, we had an equal weight loss and uh, no change in creatinine, where in the uh, ultrafiltration group, we, we had to, associated with the weight loss was an increase in, in plasma creatinine, mm -hmm. suggesting that uh, slightly worsening renal function mm -hmm. with the ultrafiltration group. Right. So this is an interesting uh, point. Um, do you think this was related to excessive volume loss, or did the patient cohort uh, have underlying unrecognized renal disease as a part of their overall heart failure syndrome? Well, certainly um, the patients did have some underlying renal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the mean creatinine at entry was approximately 2.1. 2 okay. mm -hmm. So whether it was from their comorbidities or their comorbidities in conjunction with their heart failure, right. they did have underlying sure. renal dysfunction. Okay. I think that um, the patients actually lost volume uh, the endpoint was assessed at 96 hours after entry, so four days. So they had the same weight loss over this four-day period. And actually, the rate of weight loss was not different, significantly different between the two groups. Um, so I think, was it too fast in one group versus the other? Uh, it's not, this trial doesn't clearly suggest that because right, they sure. had the same weight loss and yet the patients treated with ultrafiltration had somewhat worse uh, 
uh, worsening of their renal function. I think the question is, is that important? Is that the, the fact that the ultrafiltration patients had more worsening of the renal function, does that mean anything? And so that was addressed um, in several ways. First of all, they also looked at changes in creatinine at hospital discharge, and mm -hmm. then subsequently at, sure. at 60 day follow up. Okay. And so there was this worsening of renal function at the 96 hour endpoint, but the two groups were equivalent at discharge and, and on follow up. Okay. So um, while the group in terms of that bivariate endpoint did worse, right. uh, does that mean that overall they did worse? Sure. And some of the secondary endpoints of the trial addressed that sort of clinical question. Okay. Um, a previous study with ultrafiltration in a less sick group, just people with decompensated right. heart failure coming in, had shown that patients treated with ultrafiltration had fewer heart failure readmissions. Right. So we were very interested in that endpoint in Caress mm -hmm. to see it. That was a small trial, very few endpoints, but very intriguing sure. when we're all trying to deal with um, this big problem of sure. readmissions after heart failure. So that was uh, one of the secondary endpoints. And maybe Hong could uh, enlighten you. On, yeah, on excellent. Show. Yeah, I'd like Actually, to hear about that. Before I, I said that, I mean, just to emphasize what Maggie said, the baseline characteristics between the two groups are pretty similar. Okay. And in terms of, you know, the, you know, about 65% of them had, had diabetes. So I think they do all have underlying renal, but they were very similar between sure. the two, actually. Okay. But as Maggie said, I think, you know, what's important is the, when we look at the secondary endpoints, which is 60 days uh, death or death and hospitalization, sure. it was actually similar between the two groups, actually. So okay. there, was, there was no difference from, from that aspect. Sure. Um, there was a difference in terms of the, uh, the number of adverse effects during the study group study itself. And this was in the ultrafiltration group, there was an increase in what was classified as serious adverse effects. Sure. Majority of it was due to worsening renal function and, uh, and bleeding because they needed to be happening sure. and uh, things associated with the, with the line. Okay. But once again, I think one of the important facts, like what Maggie has said, is that you know, at 60 days, we didn't see a difference right. between in terms yeah. of outcome. And I think to me, um, that is really, even though it was a secondary endpoint right. and you know, underpowered, um, we were really hoping we would see a trend um, or uh, some data to suggest that that other study's observation was real. Uh, because that would really, I think, be a game changer sure. uh, in whether we use ultrafiltration more. Correct. Now, there is an ongoing trial. Um, uh, I believe it's called uh, Avoid. Avoid, That's yes. Right. Okay. It's going to be a big trial, um, almost 900 patients. Uh -huh. Similarly structured? More like the unload trial. So okay. it'll be patients who are with just acute decompensated heart failure. Sure not stipulating that you have to have worsening renal okay, function. Sure. So more of a broader heart failure population. And the primary endpoint is, does an ultrafiltration-based strategy reduce rehospitalization? Okay. So I think that'll be a key, mm -hmm. key trial. Sure. It's um, one thing I think worth mentioning uh, that ultrafiltration is very different than what we're used to dealing with in cardiology. Usually, whether it's a drug or a device, there are multiple trials. When there's a body of evidence, the product is labeled, Correct. and you get the product, and you use it, and you know what it's supposed to do. Ultrafiltration was approved many, this particular sure. ultrafiltration device was approved many years ago just because it could do ultrafiltration right. with no data. Sure. really to suggest that it was a specific heart failure trial. So we're having to learn as we go uh, with a dearth of really sure. the kind of big randomized clinical trials that we're used to right. having. So it's been challenging to know okay. where it fits. Yeah. You bring up a very important point um, in that ultrafiltration in and of itself might be different than some of the hemodynamic effects we can see that accompany diuretics. Mm -hmm. For example, are there effects of the diuretics from a cardiovascular standpoint that may be more effective uh, in the short term with less you know, loss of uh, renal function. Mm -hmm. Was that considered in the trial uh, at all? The secondary hemodynamic effects of diuretic therapy versus right. the effects of uh, ultrafiltration therapy. Right, I think that's an interesting point. I think the nice thing about 
the, the caress study, which is unlike the unload studies, that we, uh, we had this very rigorous uh, standard uh, pharmacological mm -hmm. therapy group, which sure. we, we ensured that the patient had similar decongestion or weight loss, actually. Right. Okay. And with that, uh, like Maggie said, you know, we didn't see uh, a decrease in the hospitalization, uh -huh. unlike the unload study. Sure. But the, the difference is that the unload study, of course, the, in, in the LASIX group, there was less weight loss. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. think that is one important sure. point. Now, um, in terms of the hemodynamics, you know, we, we didn't really look too much at hemodynamics in this study, but there was a recent small one center uh, experience from the Cleveland Clinic by Wilson Tank. Okay. But they looked at patients that was admitted to their uh, intensive care unit with, with, uh, with uh, uh, PA catheters. Sure. And you know, they actually showed that the, the patients who underwent ultrafiltration did have improved hemodynamics. Okay. Right? But yet, they didn't see improvement in, in, in renal function. Sure. Let me ask you one other important yeah. question. Um, um, other drugs that may have affected the hemodynamics in the mm -hmm. patients, um, in addition to the, that caused by the ultrafiltration, were patients also receiving vasodilators and other drugs to unload um, their cardiovascular uh, afterload and preload in the study? Yes. Um, at, uh, at 48 hours, as part of the uh, pharmacological Ecological uh, treatment arm, if they had not seen a good response, they were allowed to use vasodilators or inotropes according to their to their blood pressure. Okay. I believe um, about two percent of the patient had inotropes, and maybe about ten See. to twelve percent sure. received vasodilators. So. And did this skew the results at all uh, in any way uh, in the initial sort of outcomes? Well, of course, we don't. Hours. We don't really know for mm -hmm. sure yeah. if certain medicines uh, like vasodilators have specific renal preserving effects. And uh, I'll let Hong uh, uh, tell you about another study the network is doing because he's leading that trial okay. to try and get some more insight. Yeah, can you briefly tell yeah, us about so that? We are, we are doing this study called the ROLE study um, okay. where we are specifically looking at uh, the role of uh, low dose uh, dopamine or low dose neceritide, which is a vasodilator, okay. in patients with acute decompensated heart failure sure. and um, chronic renal insufficiency okay. as defined by GFR of less than 60. Okay. And in that study, we hope to, to, to define yeah. if uh, these, uh, what we consider renal adjuvant therapies, will help to preserve renal function in this group of patients. Sure. Let me uh, close uh, the session by asking for the practitioner um, and his or her colleagues, um, what, what are they to take away from this in terms of ultrafiltration versus the standard sort of approach with diuretic therapy, and especially as it relates to prolonged hospitalization and or readmissions, if you can summarize yeah. that for us. Well, I think uh, we could, I can summarize what, what our approach will okay. be, is that important to remember these were patients who were to some degree diuretic resistant sure. uh, and getting worsening renal function. And certainly there was nothing in this trial to suggest to us that uh, ultrafiltration uh, approach uh, is inherently better than step pharmacological sure. care. Okay. So our initial approach will be step pharmacological care. However, the conclusion of the paper, which I very much agree with, is that these can be incredibly challenging sure. patients. And this was probably a spectrum. And there are patients who are both getting worsening renal function and who are incredibly diuretic refractory, sure. despite high-dose diuretics, okay. multi-diuretics, and it's those patients that we continue to be challenged sure. by. And I think that ultrafiltration <coughs> still has a role there, uh, but it needs to be in partnership with our nephrologists Thank you. Yes. because some of those patients may end up needing renal replacement right. therapy. Sure. Well, we're clearly um, there will have to be ongoing studies, yep. uh, it appears. Um, and we look forward to seeing your study, Dr. Chen, and additional studies that may uh, give us some more insight into how we can best treat these patients. Uh, thanks for your lively insights uh, today. Um, and thank you to our viewers. Uh, we hope we can, you can continue to follow our roundtable reviews uh, on theheart.org. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. It's our thanks, pleasure. Eddie. Thank you. Thanks.